Snowpiercer Season 4, Episode 4, North Star Review. So the slow start drag is real in this episode. We are almost halfway done with the season and I'm still not really confident what the main thrust of this is going to be. Like I know I said it would be a Leighton Retrieves Liana revenge kind of story. Her being taken at this point feels really arbitrary. A way to force Leighton into the story, especially in this like avenging angel. Big Alice finally catches up to Snowpiercer. There's some kind of storm thing happening in New Eden. This is a lot of building, rising action, not a lot of resolution or like thrust forward for the story. It's especially frustrating because we've seen Big Alice overtake Snowpiercer before. We've seen a pirate train take over the main train. This is the third time the show is doing this premise and it's the second time Leighton's been in charge of it. But frustrated feelings aside, let's go ahead and dive into an analysis of this episode starting with the characters. Back in New Eden they're facing a large storm with unpredictable weather draining their power resources faster than anticipated, potentially causing damage that would interrupt power or their ability to collect power in general. I kind of feel like the pressure of time was enough to create tension and concern for New Eden, but we do get a look at Javi as a leader. His presentation makes a lot of sense. He's not a comforting leader. As an engineer he's used to facing the reality and brainstorming solutions or people like coming together to shore up what they can to make things last as long as possible. Historically if he'd wasted time sugarcoating things people might not have realized the severity and they might not have had enough time to actually solve the problem before the train failed. And I think it's fair for Hoffy to expect people to respond positively to a no-nonsense truth first approach. After all the people of Snowpiercer have historically faced a lot of weather and near-miss troubles. They number one want to know that they were heading into a danger area and maybe number two like brainstorm ways to shut down various cars maybe move people into AGSEC in the town hall so we could cut off life support to the individual homes and through that preserve power for a little bit longer maybe even find a way to make enough power to regenerate these crucial core areas keep everyone alive until Big Alice returns. Oz is here trying to move the plot along by finding a frozen arm and up in the mountains and dragging Roach out to go see the spot he found it. I'm really interested about this explanation for why Oz is quote unquote hearing voices. Are we going to go for a tried and true feelings pick up radio waves kind of scenario? Is this going to relate back to the environmental thing and him being at the higher altitude, maybe having a special medical condition, create some kind of insanguination, blood bleed in his brain, and that makes him like lose time and hallucinate and stuff? I think of everyone here right now, Oz is the biggest wild card in what he will contribute, what his final arc will be. And this moves us into Sykes who is in charge of the crops and I didn't realize till this episode she wasn't actually on the council. I thought as head of AgSec she would be so important her input and her place would be assured. Do you think this is like a OG Wilfordite kind of prejudice going on among the town to not include her in this way? It's also very interesting to me they trust her to grow their food and keep it safe but they don't trust her to have a voice at the council. Which moves us into Roach who's so far doing what I expected him to do and I have no notes. Bringing us back aboard Big Alice and starting with Leighton. He's still super focused on Liana to the point of like abusing other people and not even thinking of other children that he's connected to like Miles. Sort of alienate him from Josie and potentially alienate him from other people on Big Alice. I do think this like single-minded focus makes him a little slow to respond in the episode and perhaps explains why things don't go super well. And I am very curious to see where he goes with the Admiral's request for like Big Big Alice in exchange for Liana. If he trades Big Alice for Liana, he is essentially surrendering himself to the international peacekeepers since he has no way to go anywhere and no place to return to. Even from Leighton's perspective that this is a viable option or something that he can realistically consider. Which leaves me kind of wondering about the Admiral's tactic overall. Josie opens up this episode. We get to see that she's still like the beating heart of this revolution, concerned about the people. There's a little bit more to it than that. We also get to see her concerned mother come out and how she can't really choose between her adopted son Miles or her adopted child Liana. In both cases she really needs assurance that they're well and being taken care of. She wants to get them both out, not sacrifice one for the other. And I think the fact that Leighton has prioritized 
his biological daughter ahead of his adopted son is sort of helping Josie to see his true colors in this moment. And it's making me wonder if Leighton has always been one of those people where bio kids are more important than adopted kids, which makes him a bad person and like have his priorities messed up. And I think ultimately would drive a like permanent wedge between him and Josie's relationship and might actually like divorce and break up his entire found family at the end. Ruth is back into her soothing, hospitality-esque kind of role. I think she made the wrong choice when she chases Snowpiercer onto the alternative track. And I think at the end of the day, she didn't really consider what her primary goals were, which isn't to retrieve Liana or to make sure Leighton and Josie can come back. It's to make sure Big Alice can return to New Eden. And hopping off of Wilford track means that they can swap the tracks back and lock Big Alice in behind Snowpiercer with no way to reverse and return to New Eden. At least that's how I think trains work. And if that's the case, she's basically signed everyone at New Eden's death unless they can overtake the international peacekeepers and take over the entire facility. Alex is super dismissive of Ben and Miles' safety, just simply stating someone has to drive the train, which I think, first of all, doesn't acknowledge that other people could learn to drive the train, or that like other engineers could come in and think that they know enough about the train to get their core mission accomplished. It's not like they care if Snowpiercer continues after that. But it did have me wondering if she was like being emotionally detached in like a Wilfred Melanie-esque kind of way, if she was being like a thoughtless, careless, kind of teen who sort of thinks everyone will be fine in the end, or if she is like showing a certain level of like entitlement that both like being an engineer and being with Wilfred so long sort of drilled into her. Which moves us on to Snowpiercer, Till's here, Ben's here, Miles is here. Maybe the only thing notable is we also got to see a hint of Tristan, and while he is an overseer for like the work going on, he also is an early alarm system if the soldiers are coming in to attack someone, which shows that he chose the side of resistance, all things told. And I think that's an interesting development for his character, even though we've seen very little of him. Because historically, he's been very meek, and he's just kind of gone with whoever the leader is at the time. And in this case, the leader would be the Admiral, but he seems to be resisting in the ways he feels he can. And moving us into Admiral Milius, I feel like he's got to have something over Nima, whether that's just guilt or like Nima doing some kind of atrocity that he wants to keep hidden. I don't know what this juncture, but there's something in their relationship that's weird. And Nima is just here being wishy-washy and sucking. I really don't have a lot of commentary on him. Yes, we discover he did some human experimentation. Yes, he's got some kind of weird connection with the Admiral. We just don't know enough at this juncture for me to like make any guesses about his personality or to speculate about what he will or won't do in the future. Moving us into specific scenes, the shaky camera is awful. It continues to be very extreme and terrible. I know I say it every episode, I'm going to continue to say it every episode that it makes my stomach upset. I don't know why this style is coming back, I have to assume it's just because they wanted to make this as cheaply as possible, but it's really hurting the show and my overall ability to enjoy it. Moving into the themes, the only one that really is relevant is are the kids okay? We learn that on Snowpiercer they've separated the children from their parents and that this is sort of how they've assured compliance. And this sort of like continues to solidify the idea of legacy and the continuation of the human race being the priority above all else for all people, even though they're doing it in very cross-purpose ways between the Admiral and Snowpiercer. I also found it really interesting that Miles is living in the children's bunk, which makes me think maybe my assumption that he was a quote-unquote adult now is wrong and he's still considered a child within show canon. It also kind of explains why Miles is often dismissed in scenes, like he just gets to stand there and listen in on conversations and pass information. He gets to pick up the radio even with the soldier watching when I don't think Ben would have ever gotten that chance. I think just being quiet and sulky has got him a lot in like the teen underestimate him kind of window. We also get to see Roach and his daughter interact. I don't necessarily think it does anything with this specific theme so much as it shows that like Roach is doing a lot of things for the future of his daughter and he values her and her safety above his own. But like we could have already sort of assumed that with a man like Roach. And that's really really all I have to say about this episode. I really like this one the least. I am hoping 5 really punches it up and gives us something to talk about and like a better sense of direction. Rumor has it Wilfred is going to pop back up onto the scene, which I don't think we're set well for. I think that's just going to 
gonna be a mess. But what do I know? I've been wrong before. Are you still watching Snowpiercer? And if so, what did you think of this episode? Let me know in those comments below. And as always, keep reading. <laughs>